This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. Welcome to another edition of Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, produced by uh, uh, Democracy at Work, uh, which is a non-profit organization, uh, 10 years old now, which is dedicated to critical analysis and uh, the construction of a uh, a uh, far fairer, more democratic, and equitable world. I want to thank all those people who watch this and participating in this uh, exercise, in this mission. And I want to thank those who uh, provide funding uh, very sincerely because uh, all of us need if you, you know, to cover expenses, and uh, that is a very important part of the function. So no matter whether you contribute or not, you are still part of uh, the mission, and we are very grateful uh, to your presence. Now, today I want to just uh, give a shout out to somebody who has been terribly important throughout my political life, which is uh, Daniel Ellsberg. I received the uh, rather sad news uh, just a short while ago through a circular that uh, pointed out that uh, from Daniel Ellsberg saying that he'd been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and that it was inoperable and that he was given something like three to six months to live. He is, of course, uh, 92 years old, and I think that uh, he's led a very rich life and a very important life, and I wanted to uh, just uh, mention all of this because I think that it is appropriate that we uh, thank him for uh, what seems to me to be an admirable service uh, in the cause of uh, peace and justice uh, on the earth. As you may know, Daniel Ellsberg's main claim to fame was to have uh, photocopied what were known as the Pentagon Papers, uh, in which it became clear that uh, the US government was lying to everybody about the status of things in the Vietnam War that the Vietnam War was not going anywhere near as well as they thought, and that it was headed pretty much almost certainly to defeat. Uh, Ellsberg had these papers, um, which were, I think, produced in something like 1968 and in 1971. Uh, he released them to the New York Times and then to the Washington Post and then to the European uh, newspapers. Uh, and for that, of course, he was uh, uh, condemned and indicted. Uh, and he would have faced 135 years or 115 years or something like that uh, in prison. Uh, um, but uh, it turned out, uh, fortunately for him and fortunately for us, uh, that uh, the government had engaged in such uh, unconstitutional practices, such as uh, un unauthorized uh, wiretapping and so on, that the government's case against him could not proceed. And so all of the charges were thrown out and he did not end up uh, spending any time uh, in jail uh, for the release of those papers, uh, which then led him to a life of political activism, anti-war activism, uh, and uh, therefore I think that this is, uh, again, a significant uh, contribution. Now, I've said he was fortunate because Generally speaking, whistleblowers uh, don't have the kind of fate that uh, he had. Uh, one looks at what happened to uh, Snowden, who is, uh, in the end is now still exiled in, in Russia. Uh, one looks at what's happened to Julian Assange, uh, what's happened to all of those who've uh, actually done a great job of uh, uh, revealing how much the government lies, how much it uh, dissembles and uh, how much it conceals uh, from uh, the, the public in terms of uh, arguments which are, as they famously called, reasons of state. Now, my argument here will be that uh, two lessons, if you like, from, from, uh, from Ellsberg's uh, uh, history. The first is that uh, individuals do make a difference. And they can make a difference, uh, remarkably so, providing they are prepared to take the risk. 
Uh, Ellsberg had always recognized that he was likely to spend the rest of his life in jail uh, by releasing the papers. He was therefore extremely fortunate and testified, of course, later on uh, to, our, to the case uh, in, in support of Assange. Uh, the, the whistleblowers in general get very badly treated and whistleblower law needs to be badly reformed and very, very carefully set up so that uh, the, the sort of thing that's happened to Assange cannot happen to anybody. It's not only Assange, but all of the people around Assange who are being threatened uh, at the same time, but Ellsberg uh, was, uh, was, was, was not. So the whole kind of question of public confidence now, we live in a situation, of course, where the mainstream media are constantly harping upon uh, the lies that Donald Trump tells about the last election, about this and that and everything. So it's constant harping on the fact that he is a liar. But what Ellsberg showed, and I think that actually this was a, a, a key point in American history, was the degree to which the U.S. government was lying. And the lies that it, well, the U.S. government was was peddling were consequential lies. And we saw this again in terms of the run-up to the Iraq War. The Iraq War was founded on a set of lies about uh, what uh, Saddam Hussein was up to. Uh, those those lies were were taken before uh, you know, uh, the UN uh, by Colin Powell. They were taken uh, to the public by Condoleezza Rice, and at this point, I think we can kind of say, look, there's a real difference between, you know, just lies and consequential lies. Now, some of the lies which Donald Trump tells are consequential lies, but most of them are just trivial lies. You know, the size of the of the number of people who came to see him at uh, on his inauguration day, or things of that kind. Uh, they're just they're, they're just fairly fairly trivial. But consequential lies are, I think, what we have to look at, and what Ellsberg was looking at was the consequential lie uh, of uh, American involvement in Vietnam and uh, the prosecution of the Vietnam War and the concealment from the U.S. public of much of what was going on in terms of uh, uh, you know, U.S. military deaths in, in, uh, and the like. And we have been subject to these kinds of lies in, in, in Iraq and, 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 and the like. So, there comes a point where the public uh, learns not to trust at all what government says. One worries a great deal about what kinds of lies are being perpetuated right now around Ukraine. I don't know quite what the inner circums in a group is saying, but I do not think that the Ukraine war is being fought for exactly the reasons that, uh, that Biden keeps on outlining. Uh, when you start to ask the question, who benefits from this war and what benefits do they get, then obviously the defense industries are very you know, very happy right now. Uh, obviously, the, there are various other features that are happy right now. We are concealing things about our, our operation. For, for instance, uh, uh, the essay that came out uh, uh, by Seymour Hirsch recently in the New York Magazine uh, about the blowing up of the Nordstrom uh, pipeline, uh, which everybody said was sabotaged. And it's fairly clear from Seymour Hirsch's account that the United States blew up the pipeline. And they blew up the pipeline because uh, this was the major means by which uh, Russia was uh, going to uh, and, and, and was uh, currently actually providing uh, oil to, to, to Germany and the like. So, uh, you know, Biden said very early on that the, that the U.S. would take care of that problem and take care of it they did by sabotaging the, the, the pipeline. Now, this is not public knowledge. It's only Seymour Hersh bringing it out and, 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 and giving considerable amount of evidence that, that this was the case. Now, of course, Germany has to, has to switch its uh, sources of energy, uh, and the rest of Europe has to switch the sources of energy away from Russia to guess where? 
I guess, increasingly from uh, the U.S., liquid nas- natural gas from the U.S. So uh, the U.S. is benefiting very well, and the uh, oil companies in the U.S. are benefiting very well from U.S. policy of blowing up the pipeline. So here's the sort of thing that Ellsberg was expert at revealing, and we still are getting revelations coming out uh, which suggest that the government is concealing, lying, uh, about particularly about more wartime uh, conditions and wartime activities, but even further than that, also uh, lying about certain aspects of uh, public policy and the like. So that the distrust of central government, uh, which Ellsberg I think fueled, because up until then, uh, to the late to the mid 1960s, there was always a kind of a, a, a skepticism about the Vietnam War and what was going on and the like. But and the population in general, I think, felt that uh, somehow or other war was justified given the kinds of ways in which the government, uh, and the government was broadly trusted to tell us what was going on. But when it was came clear that the government was concealing uh, what was going on, that was the end. Now we've come to a point now where nobody trusts the government anymore, which is unfortunate in some respects. But nevertheless, uh, I think that Ellsberg uh, led the way uh, towards that mistrust of government and uh, with this critical kind of perspective. And I think that this critical perspective is something which needs uh, to be kept uh, alive and kept uh, in, 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 in motion. The second thing which uh, Ellsberg did was he was also part of the planning mechanism uh, within the Rand Corporation and eventually within government institutions, which were really planning public military and and international policy uh, from the 1950s onwards. And Ellsberg was part of that and therefore was very well schooled in terms of uh, some of the things that were going on, and recently he's drawn upon that uh, uh, upon that history uh, to um, uh, emphasize some of the ways in which the U.S. military had been and still continues to think about uh, the policy of, uh, with respect to the use of nuclear weapons. And in 1958, I think it was, uh, Ellsberg was part of a panel, a group of people who were looking into the whole kind of question of what would happen if uh, uh, People's Republic of China invaded uh, uh, Taiwan, uh, and what would the case be for the use of limited, uh, limited use of uh, nuclear weapons in the event of such a, an invasion? Uh, if so, what would the response be in terms of uh, what China might do, having a, a few military, having a few uh, uh, nuclear warheads, and what, of course, uh, would uh, Soviet Union, then Soviet Union, do, uh, then being in pretty close alliance with uh, with China. So what what Elber, Ellsberg did recently is to report report on the kind of uh, uh, thinking that was uh, behind that 58, and to recognize that, that the thinking is uh, are very, uh, very much still with us. To begin with, uh, at that time, the U.S. claimed the right of first strike. That is, uh, if it felt a, a situation arose in which a preemptive nuclear strike would, could be justified, the U.S. should, in principle, be able to assert the right to first strike. Now, this is a part of uh, military doctrine, which is uh, highly problematic, but it still sort of floats around uh, very much. Uh, right now, the U.S. tends to sort of say it's not about first strike, but there are currents of thought within the military that say that a first strike would be justified. The second thing is to get some sort of assessment on on uh, the uh, on the impact of a, of a nuclear exchange. Uh, Ellsberg's recent book on the doomsday uh, scenario is a very important contribution, to, and I think we should all be looking at it because, you know, we're not too far from a nuclear confrontation given global politics of the present time. And that's something which uh, needs to be uh, un- 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 understood. So what, what Ellsberg did 
in 1958 was to kind of, uh, and, and, and again in, in most recently, 19, in 2017 or whenever it was, he published this stuff on the doomsday uh, uh, scenario. The, 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 this this um, doomsday thing contained one other, some other uh, uh, calculations from 1958. One of the calculations was that millions of people would die from a first strike. And 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 the re the inevitable response that would come to a first strike, uh, and and so we have a million deaths, immediate deaths. You'd have uh, millions of deaths afterwards from radiation sicknesses, uh, and the long term, of course, the cancers and all the rest of it. So there would be a huge uh, impact upon population. But there was another feature of the doomsday. Uh, scenario, which I think is you know, very fascinating to look at, which is what was called the thesis of a nuclear winter. I'll deviate here to, to something else, uh, that in 1815, Lord Byron, the poet, uh, and his poet friend, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley, and his wife, uh, Mary Shelley, decided to go to Geneva and spend a nice summer in Geneva together. And they were surprised to find that the weather in, the, in, in, uh, in Geneva got worse and worse. And they found themselves in midsummer having to sit around a log fire because it was so damn cold and rainy in Geneva. And in fact, the whole summer was absolutely awful. And there were crop failures all over the place, all over the world. And actually, some of the poetry of Lord Byron from that period is so gloomy that everybody attributes it to the fact that they were living through what was one of the worst summers that had ever been experienced in Europe. And it was then transpired that the bad summer was due to a volcanic eruption, um, Mount Tambora, I think it's called, in Indonesia, which chucked huge amounts of soot and ash and dirt and all the rest of it into the atmosphere in a violent explosion, and which continued in a series of violent exposures. And as a result, uh, the atmosphere was just full of dust and full of soot. And, uh, you know, sun, sunlight could not penetrate. And the result was uh, that you got almost winter conditions in the middle of summer in Geneva. Now, the what the 1958 studies suggested was that the impact of a nuclear exchange would be the production of what was called a nuclear winter. And the nuclear winter would envisage that the firestorms that would, would occur in, in these major cities, firestorms of the sort that had occurred in Tokyo in 1945 and in Dresden in 1944, that, that they, these, these firestorms would put so much junk up into the atmosphere that there will be no chance of the sun shining very brightly almost anywhere in the world uh, for a period of years. Now, in the Tambora case, uh, it seems to have uh, lessened by only a year. Uh, there was just one year, which was very bad. The next year was not good, but it wasn't anywhere near as bad. And so we get a return to normal within about three years. But the nuclear winter suggested that if this went on for 10 years, imagine what that would mean in terms of global starvation. Most of the vertebrates within the world would, would, would lose their, their, their food supply. There was no possibility of it being, being uh, main, maintained, except in very small clumps in very small places. So, so this idea of a nuclear winter came in. Now, it's since been criticized, and, and everybody kind of says, well, actually, uh, it's nowhere near likely. It would be short term, if at all. There was a doubt over whether firestorms would really result. Uh, the sort that occurred in Nagasaki and Hiroshima would really result in uh, all over the place. And, and in any case, the soot would come out of the, uh, the atmosphere in terms of, uh, black rain, which did occur after, uh, the eruption in Indonesia. Um, and I, I recall um, being in Argentina after a Chilean uh, volcano exploded. And it was a very, very interesting because when it rained, 
you ended up with your car just covered with a kind of almost layer of cement of volcanic ash uh, contained in the water. So the, the point would be that a lot of this vulc- ash and so on would be brought out of the atmosphere very rapidly through through trains. So there's a lot of criticism of nuclear. Most, pe- most, most people don't uh, credit it, but uh, too much. Uh, it's, it's an outside probability, put it that way. What what Ellsberg is, is, is was doing was to kind of say, look, this question of nuclear exchange is still very much with us. Uh, the idea of first use has to be ruled out. There has to be an, a movement towards the abolition of the existence of nuclear weapons. And what is very distressing here is to say that actually in the current climate, what we're seeing is an increase in, in for instance, China, has has nuclear weapons, but has very few warheads until recently. And I've forgotten the numbers that came on the radio the other day that uh, China has tripled its, its nuclear warheads and plans to triple them again uh, over the next few years so that China will become a major nuclear power instead of a minor nuclear power. And of course, some countries which have nuclear weapons uh, and are coming close to nuclear weapons uh, are, are very threatening. For example, Israel has l- nuclear weapons. Nobody sort of uh, officially accepts that, but everybody knows that's the case. Uh, if Iran decides to get nuclear rap- weapons, it's very close to weapons-grade enrichment right now. It could create uh, a nuclear power very easily. Uh, and, and end up being with having a nuclear warhead, and the idea of Iran and Israel with nuclear warheads is uh, nearly is very very dangerous. As is the relationship between Pakistan and India. So there are all kinds of issues of this kind. What Daniel Ellsberg was talking about was a uh, this. Um, yeah, very important that there be a global movement uh, towards uh, global nuclear disarmament and that nuclear disarmament proceed uh, apace. So uh, Daniel Ellsberg uh, is an iconic figure, an iconic figure who I think had an incredible life uh, and at the same time dedicated himself to creating a nuclear-free world uh, in which we could live in peace at night without the threat of, of war, and that we need uh, very much, in, I think, uh, for our own sakes and our, our children's sakes, to try to initiate a movement towards denuclearization of uh, as, many, as many powers as possible uh, in, uh, in the near future. Uh, this is going to rely upon the development of an anti-war movement, and I've mentioned this before. Uh, there used to be a campaign for nuclear disarmament in Britain, which was very strong and very significant. We need to c- keep that sort of stuff on online, and it is certainly one of the things which uh, uh, democracy at work is, I think, very much concerned concerned with as part and parcel uh, of our contribution uh, to the debate of the current times. There is a peace march emerging in a couple of weeks' time in Washington. I think that this is, again, one of the signs of the time that maybe uh, peace marches of this kind uh, need to become more global. Uh, and uh, in the same way that uh, February the 15th of uh, uh, 2003, millions and millions of people turned out all over the world uh, against the prospect of war with Iraq, uh, they failed, but on the other hand, there was, was an expression of global opinion. We need a, an equally powerful expression of global opinion uh, of this sort today, and I think it would be a fitting tribute uh, in, in Daniel Ellsberg's memory that uh, we uh, uh, recognize his uh, vital contributions and, and thank him for uh, what he did and how he did it because this was a very transformative point in U.S. politics, and I think that we keep we need to keep that tradition very strongly alive. Thank you for listening, and as always, I hope you will keep abreast of what is going on through uh, democracyatwork.info, and uh, that you can uh, be with us and contribute as much as you can to the politics uh, of that we are trying uh, to elaborate upon uh, in these sessions. 
Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. Thank you.